If you like Academic Agent's content on this channel, sign up for a course on the Academic Agency. He's now offering Foundations of Economics. Click the link in the show description and level up your econ knowledge. Hello everyone. This video is going to be about why, in my view, the slippery slope is not a fallacy. I'm actually making this video as a kind of favor to my friend Radical Liberation, who wanted a video that he could just point to, rather than having to explain this again and again when he's talking to people. So, Radlib, this one is for you, buddy. All of the examples I'll be giving you today are taken from the book A Concise Introduction to Logic by Patrick J. Hurley and Laurie Watson. Now, the reason that I was talking about this at all is because I wrote a course, which you can purchase from the academic agency called Foundations of Logic. And when I was putting that course together, I became increasingly dissatisfied with a lot of these modern textbooks. So if you do take Foundations of Logic, you will not find this book uh, by Hurley and Watson anywhere on the reading list because all of my uh, recommendations come from, uh, or, or most of them come from before 1945. Um, where you don't get this sort of thing as much. So anyway, as it is stated in uh, a concise introduction to logic, the slippery slope fallacy has this form. If A, then B. If B, then C. Uh, so, and so on and so forth. If Y, then uh, Z. So the slippery slope tends to be an argument where you say, well, if you take one small step, then it's going to snowball eventually until you get catastrophic consequences. So before we get into the various uh, examples here, first I think it's important, especially uh, for newcomers to this channel, to note that I make absolutely no value judgments at all in this analysis. I am simply looking at the underlying logic. So it does not actually matter if you have a particular stance on any of these uh, issues that uh, we're going to look at here, some of which are quite contentious and some of which are considered beyond the pale in 2021 because they're, some of them are historical examples, as you'll see. And also, one thing to note before we get into the examples, it's worth remembering that an argument can be both logically valid and untrue. Or an argument can also be logically invalid and true. So anyway, the first uh, argument they uh, use as an example of the slippery slope fallacy is this one. Immediate steps should be taken to outlaw pornography once and for all. The continued manufacture and sale of pornographic material will almost certainly lead to an increase in sex-related crimes such as rape and incest. This, in turn, will gradually erode the moral fabric of society and result in an increase in crimes of all sorts. Eventually, a complete disintegration of law and order will occur, leading, in the end, to the total collapse of civilization. And there were many uh, people in history who made arguments like this. Uh, for example, in this country, Mary Whitehouse, um, made an argument with this, not even with pornography. She she was trying to get se uh, sexually explicit material uh, taken off uh, BBC and ITV television. She just wrote letters and encouraged other people to write letters to television bosses to get certain shows taken off air. Now, one of the reasons that the Slippery Slope warrants special attention is because Slippery Slope arguments like this have a habit of coming true. And again, it doesn't actually matter whether you support a ban on pornography or not. I would warrant that the large majority of the audience of this channel, being libertarians like my friend uh, Radical Liberation, would not support such a ban. But let's just have a look at what's happened since the time that Mary Whitehouse was making her arguments in the 1960s and the 1970s. Well... One of the things that Mary Whitehouse argued against is that if you keep on depicting uh, LGBT sorts of issues uh, on the television and if you encourage it in schools, which she was against, you will get an increase in the number of LGBT people in society. And it just so happens that there has been such an increase. In fact, uh, from 1.6% of people now to 
2.2% of people, which overall is a 37.5% increase, not insignificant, and if you were Mary Whitehouse, not at all surprising. Let us uh, continue. Another uh, part of this argument was STD rates. Well, they have increased dramatically since 1950, and in interestingly, more liberal areas, such as London, have higher rates. And uh, yeah, there's been a huge increase in the number of STDs in this country. And now, let us get to the more extreme example. If you remember in the example from the logic textbook, they'd say, well, an increase in pornography would also increase the number of sexual offences. Well, did that happen? Let's have a look. I have taken all of these numbers from the Office of National Statistics. They are uh, numbers for England and Wales. So the, the Office of National Statistics only includes the raw data and the population. I have had to work out the sexual offences per 1,000 myself. But in 1901, there was about 1.5 thousand sexual offences out of a population of 32.5 million. Well, which works out as uh, a per 1,000 rate of 0 0.05. If you have a look by 1961, and I think everybody would agree there was more porn about in 1961 than there was in 1901, um, you have, uh, it jumps up to 20.4 thousand, which is a sexual offences per 1,000 rate of 0 0.4. So that's a, that's a huge increase from 1901 just there. And you, everybody would agree that uh, Britain, England and Wales were more socially and sexually liberal in 1961 than they were in 1901. And then 30 years later, in 1991, it's jumped up to 29.4 thousand. Uh, the per 1,000 rate is uh, 0.6. And if we look at last year, the, the data cuts off in March 2020. So it's for, from uh, you know March 2019 to March 2020. Uh, so that predates any uh, COVID restrictions or lockdowns. Uh, the number of sexual offences was 162.9 thousand out of a population of 56 million for England and Wales, which is a per 1,000 rate of 2.9. So if you want to have a look how it has increased from 1901, that's a 10.1 thousand percent increase in the raw offences and a 5.7 thousand percent increase in the per 1000 rate. Now for those of you who are against uh, pornography bans you're probably falling over yourself uh, thinking well probably pornography is not the reason uh, there's some other reason or you're trying to explain away the figures you're trying to say well you know maybe the 1901 figures aren't accurate or but Forget all of that. The, the fact of the matter is, is that reality has fit the path of the person who's made the slippery slope argument, and it has not fit the path of the people that they were fighting against. And uh, we'll return, and this is just the empirical data, I will return to the underlying logic and why it's not a fallacy in a second. But I think you'd all agree that in every area, whether it whether it's the number of LGBT people in society, whether it's the, uh, the the total STD rates or whether it's the number of sexual offences, they're all up in the pornography age uh, versus uh, ages where people were more set socially and sexually conservative, like the end of the Victorian era there. That is beyond doubt. So those are the facts. If you're trying to explain away the facts, you have to then think, well, why am I doing that? Just, just stop yourself questioning the facts and let's think more about now, is the slippery slope a fallacy? Let's have another, another look at another uh, example here. It was quite interesting to me that all of the examples uh, in the textbook happen to be um, what I describe as liberal progressive type issues. Um, so the argument provided here is today women want the vote, tomorrow they'll want to be doctors and lawyers and then combat soldiers, give them that, and before long they'll insist on taking the initiative in sex. If you want to protect the very meaning of masculinity, you must deny them suffrage. Well, again, this is a pretty extreme slippery slope argument, but, I mean, I don't even need to pull up data to show you. Well, 
Did women become doctors and lawyers? Yes. Is there a push for women to be combat soldiers in 2021? And has there been for the past 30 years? Yes. Uh, was there not a huge push to, uh, uh, you know, for women to embrace their sexuality and to take the initiative in sex in the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s? Yeah, I mean, yes, all of these things did happen, didn't they? And has there been an attack on the notion of masculinity in the past uh, 100 years or in the past 50 years or in the past 10 years? I mean, the answer is obvious. Yes. In fact, the rate of testosterone in the world, the, the levels of testosterone worldwide have plummeted. And in the West in particular, there are record number numbers of men who now either identify as women or who want to be women or who dress up as women. I mean, these things are all happening. Those are the facts of the matter. Now, you may agree, you may agree with women's suffrage. That's not in question here. The question is, was the person who made that initial argument correct or not? They were correct. All of those things happened. So, again, we will return to the underlying logic in a second. Is it really a fallacy? So here is the final and perhaps the most controversial example that they provide in the textbook. This is from N. L. Rice in 1845. He says, then a coloured man might be the next governor of states having a black majority and coloured men might constitute their legislature and sit on the bench as judges in their courts. Thus, the entire administration in those states would be placed in the hands of degraded men, wholly ignorant of the principles of law and government. Now, obviously, there is a there is an issue with Rice's uh, argument here, which is not um, part of the slippery slope argument. The, the problem with his argument is his assumption that just because somebody is black, it means that they would be degraded or be ignorant of the principles of law and government. So we have to say, well, that's a racist assumption right there. And it's not necessarily the case. But that's not a fault of the of the slippery slope argument. That's just because N. L. Rice in eighteen forty five probably had the you know, those racist attitudes. So let's uh, ignore that part and think about the other part of his argument, which is if you grant black men the vote, you're then going to have uh, black people in positions of power and serving as judges. Well, did that happen? I mean, yes, Clarence Thomas sits on the Supreme Court. Raphael Warnock has recently become, uh, became a senator uh, in the state of Georgia, which flipped blue for the first time. Uh, and, you know, the demographic uh, makeup of that state was a lot to do with how that vote went. And of course, Barack Obama has been the president. And again, it doesn't matter what your personal feelings are about any of these people or about the question of suffrage, your personal views don't matter when it comes to assessing the logic. The question is, was N.L. Rice correct in his underlying argument? And certainly, as in the other cases that we've looked at, the facts have borne out his argument in the fullness of time. So what is the problem then? What is the missing part of the argument and how can we make sure that if you are going to make an argument, which is a slippery slope argument, that uh, it doesn't fall foul of being called a fallacy? Well, it strikes me that all these arguments are missing is the unstated assumption that people respond to incentives. This is something that anyone who studies economics understands instantly. It's just missing a premise, that's all. So if I was to state the argument in modus ponens, it would be something like this. If people are given an incentive to increase behavior X, then behavior X will increase. People have been given an incentive to increase be behavior X, therefore behavior X will increase. And that is the argument that will make it work. Of course, you may need further chains in the reasoning, but you can just uh, keep on piling up the uh, modus ponens. So if A, then B, A, therefore B, if B, then C, B, therefore 
C and so on and so forth. Or, if you prefer, we can state the argument as a categorical syllogism. So incentives increase certain behaviours. This measure contains an incentive. Therefore, this measure will increase certain behaviours. Um, and this is stated in Aristotle's favourite uh, canon, the first canon. So it's a pretty watertight uh, argument in terms of its uh, logical form. And that looks like this, M is P, S is M, therefore S is P. And if you need many, many ch parts and many, many chains of the argument, you can chain that indefinitely. A is C, C is B, therefore A is B, C is D, therefore B is D, C is E, C is F, C is G, C is H, therefore A is H. If you need more parts in the so-called slippery slope argument, you just do it like that. And of course, C in this argument is the incentives. That's our missing middle term there, which is, of course, missing from uh, most of the examples of slippery slope fallacies as they are stated, because when people uh, make arguments in the real world, they often don't write them out formally in this way. Although if you did make N.L. Rice or Mary Whitehouse or any other person write out their argument in full, I'm sure they would come to something like the missing middle here, incentives. Finally, I just want to mention that the reason that the slippery slope uh, so-called fallacy deserves special attention is because unusually for logic, it has a political dimension. And this is even admitted in the logic textbook by uh, Hurley and Watson. They say the fallacy is usually committed to defend the status quo. So by their definition, there's something inherently conservative about the slippery slope fallacy because you're trying to dissuade some course of action from taking place using the slippery slope as a kind of warning. And therefore, to point out that there is such a thing as the slippery slope fallacy plays into uh, progressive hands. Now, given that we live in a progressive moment, uh, the status quo as we find ourselves in 2021, is a progressive status quo, this may actually turn, up, turn about. You may find progressives start using the slippery slope fallacy against radical conservative arguments. Who knows? But it doesn't really matter which side of the fence you're on. What matters is whether it is a fallacy or not. And the fact of the matter is, is that not only have most slippery slope arguments in history turned out to be absolutely true, uh, in the fullness of time, but also if you fill in the missing middle, if you just supply the unstated premise, which you do in most other cases, if you're going to be intellectually charitable, you know, you steel man the argument, you put it in its strongest form, then it's not a fallacy at all. It's just a prediction based on the fact that people respond to incentives. All right, hopefully this will be useful for Radlib and for everyone else. If you'd like to learn more about logic, I have a whole course on it called Foundations of Logic. I also have a recent course called Foundations of Rhetoric, which breaks all of those rules, which I'd also uh, encourage you to check out. Uh, and indeed, the other part of the Trivium Foundations of Writing. And here's a little ad to tell you more about it. Now available at the Academic Agency. Sharpen your analytical mind and your argumentation skills with Foundations of Logic. The course draws on the ancient wisdom of traditional logic that students learned for over 2,000 years, from the time of Aristotle through to the medieval schoolmen right down to the 20th century. Sign up now for a free preview lecture. Be sure to like this video and subscribe. And if you really like my content, maybe consider joining the channel or donating or maybe even buy a mug. I am grateful for all of your support. Now get out.